Public schools from coast to coast are failing to teach young students the most basic skills they need to succeed in school and life. Reading is one of the major things they're failing our students and our kids, children with. This failure is widespread and tragedy and most unnecessary. We know how to teach reading, a quote, we know how to teach reading, but many school administrators refuse to use the proven methods. The extent of this self-inflicted catastrophe, which has ruined countless lives, was driven home to me again when the new school year began several weeks ago. Me, I'm gonna tell you who me is. Some 20 years ago, Baker A. Mitchell Jr. is the founder of the Roger Bacon Academy in Lillian, North Carolina. And he manages, manages a family of four chartered schools in southeastern North Carolina. He said, this year, for the first time in our history of our school, the school's enrollment large numbers of students who transferred from traditional county public schools. Listen, of the first 168 first and second grade transfer students, 45% could not pass the basic readiness assignment to begin kindergarten level reading instruction. Not only could they not read at any level, but their spoken vocabularies were insufficient to understand reading instruction if it were taught to them. Therefore, the 51 first graders and 24 second graders are now taking a kindergarten preparatory course called Language for Learning that must be mastered before effective reading instruction can begin. The teachers knowingly knew the students were not ready to move on, pass them anyway to their next grade level. The students were not aware of their lack of readiness to move forward. All they knew is that they, were, they came to school and at the end of the school year, the teacher passed them to their next grade. That's all they knew. They did not know that there were anything inside of them that, that, that knew that they weren't ready to move forward. They were just moved forward so they didn't think anything was wrong. So my question this morning, who's to blame for those students' lack of readiness? One of the first quotes I read from this article said this, we know how to teach reading, but many school administrators refuse to use the proven methods. In order for teachers to successfully prepare these young students for meaningful education, what shall they teach? It moves us to our scripture this morning, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? I'm going to stop right there briefly. Paul is talking to Timothy. And he's talking to Timothy, and he's encouraging Timothy to preach the word. And he's encouraging Timothy because Timothy's been getting backlash of what he's teaching. 
He's getting individuals with these teachers and a bunch of teachers are coming together and they're concluding with their own idealistic way of what needs to be taught. So Paul is encouraging Timothy. He says, now let me move forward. So Paul is telling Timothy, he says, I charge you, Timothy, this morning. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who's, who shall judge the quick? He's saying the judgment doesn't lie in man. The judgment doesn't lie in teachers or people who feel they know what needs to be done. He said the, 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 the judgment falls in the lap of the one that shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. Whose kingdom? Who? In God's kingdom. So he's telling Timothy, that's the one you have to answer to. No one else. Paul goes on and tells Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season out of season, reproof, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He tells them, Timothy, you preach the word. Amen. So I ask this question, what's the word? Does anybody know? What, what's the word? Huh? Genesis Revelation. But what does the Bible say was the word? What would you say, Elder? Oh. Jesus. Preach. Jesus. Amen. Is, that, is that right, biblical interpretation? Yes. Amen. He said, preach Jesus. Amen? Amen? So he's telling, he said, preach him in season. Preach Jesus, Jesus out of season. He said Jesus is there to, for what? For reproof. He said for rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And even that's left for interpretation. What doctrine? Whose doctrine? Traditional doctrine? Man-made doctrine? Whose doctrine? He says God's doctrine, Jesus' doctrine on how things need to be run and not run. Sometimes man can come up with doctrines that fall outside of the circle of what God wants. It may make sense to them, but it doesn't make sense, and it will not make sense to God. Men will do things to please each other because they have the quote-unquote knowledge, and they feel they've understood it, they've, they've, they've digested it, and, and we understand it. But I've seen so many times in God's word where People who felt they were straight on the narrow way, locked in arm in arm with God this morning and tried to preach the word and was far as the east is from the west. Yeah. You know where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. There was a man by the name of Saul mm -hmm. who felt that he was doing what God wanted him to do. He felt that he had learned from the Mosaic law of what needs to be done. But he didn't read all the way. He didn't comprehend. He didn't allow the Holy Spirit mail to allow him to understand the fullness of, the, of what needed to be done in the beginning and then the fulfillment of it and what had to take place beyond that. Why do you think that the Lord decided to have the Gentiles Preach the gospel over the Jews who had the history of all the knowledge and everything about God. Why? Because the Jews, if he would have given it to the Jews, they would have felt they were educated enough. They would have felt they were justified enough. They would have said, we're God's chosen people. 
they would have felt all of those things and they would have moved forward with a self-righteous gospel and to preach to a dying world. But the Lord saw through it. He said, I don't need anyone to stand on their own knowledge. I don't need anyone to stand on their own self-righteousness. I don't need anyone who feels like they're they are vindicated to be the one declared to preach the gospel. He said, I'm looking for somebody who's humble. I'm looking for somebody to move themselves away. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to hear my voice, not their intellectual voice. I'm looking for someone who's going to be humble enough to hear me and not cemented in their own ideal and way of thinking, who's going to be able to move as the Holy Spirit moves. But let me make very clear, the Bible says we have to study to show ourselves a proof. Intellect is not a sin. By no means. God gives us to us. And when we recognize the intellect that we have, that God gave it to us, and it was nothing generated of ourselves, then God can use us to his fullest. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. Those that may be watching, you're wondering, Pastor, where are you coming from? In Revelation, God has an urgent love letter. God has an urgent love letter that he wants us to adhere to. It's a love letter. It's not a scary letter. It's not a forceful letter. It's not a letter to scare you to him. It's a urgent love letter that he wants you and I to know about. Why is it urgent? Because he's at the doorstep of coming back. He said, I want you to know it's an urgent love letter. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. See, itching ears can come in a lot of ways, guys. Itching ears simply mean that you want to hear what you want to hear. Amen? Itching ears saying, I want to hear what I want to hear. And if you're not preaching what I want to hear, then you're not preaching. Is that itching ears now? See, you can, you, can, you can try to theologize it, and you can try to, you know, mix the soup up, but and you can think that itching ears mean something emotional or something charismatic, but itching ears is when you want to hear what you want to hear and not coming open to God's sanctuary to let him preach to you and I. See, we don't know what we need. We don't. But God knows what, what we need. And we can't be cemented that if we don't hear what we think we need to hear, then God's not speaking to us. God's got a message for each and every one of us that come through this door. If you humble yourself, you'll hear it. But if you come in with these preconceived ideas of what preachers, pastors need to preach, you're going to miss it. So Paul's telling Timothy, preach in season and out of season. You've got to stay the course and you've got to preach the truth. And verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn unto fables. But he tells Timothy this. He said, but watch thou in all things. He said, Timothy, endure the afflictions. Endure the attacks. Endure those who will come against you. He says, but do the work of an evangelist. 
And then this is what he tells them. He says, and make full proof of thy ministry. Don't let no one turn you around. You preach the word God has given you to preach, and you make full use of the gifts and the word and the talent that he's given you. You make full proof of it, and you don't have to turn to the left nor to the right. I'm, I'm going somewhere this morning. So the title of the message is this morning, what shall we preach? Mm -hmm. Sister Jenkins, what shall we preach? The first angel's message can be found in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. What shall we preach? And it reads, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, every tribe, every tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water What shall we preach? See, God gave a message to Noah. And when God gave the message to Noah, it wasn't Noah's message. Listen to me. It wasn't Noah's message. God told Noah to preach the message. So he couldn't proclaim this is Noah's message. It was God's message. Revelation 14, how long ago was that written? So no, stay with me now this morning, no person, no group, no proclaim authority of theology can proclaim this is their message. Amen. No one can do that. Yeah. Why? Because it's God's message. But who will stand up to preach it? God's message. Revelation 14 is an urgent love letter from God. Okay, let's move forward. Move forward. The everlasting gospel. God's people do not proclaim, God's people do not proclaim a new gospel to the world. They share the gospel message of salvation which has never changed. That is why it's called the everlasting gospel. Even though God may have a special message in the last days, and he do, we must always be careful never to de-emphasize or de-start the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the same message of salvation that 
people in the old times accepted by faith, the same teaching that Jesus himself proclaimed, the same message the disciples preached to conquer the world for Christ, the same gospel that has thundered down through the centuries of Christian era, and God's people preach it around the world today. The first angel's message, this same simple saving gospel message, but puts it in a new setting, a worldwide setting. And the focus on people who are living in the last days just before Jesus returns. This last day message calls on people to fear God, which means reverence, and give glory to him. Giving glory to God means to reflect his character. Uh Uh-oh, listen. To reflect, Pat, his character through our lives. Are we together so far? Those who are part of God's church in the days before his second coming will demonstrate God's character of love to the world. Not only by their words, but also by their lives of dynamic witness. They offer an exciting revelation of what God can do through sinful, wicked, Mankind who are now filled with the spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ. When will this message, those who are a part of God's church, okay, fill with that. Okay, yeah, John 15, 8 tells us that again. When will these messages be proclaimed? When were these three angel messages to be proclaimed throughout the world? When the hour of God's judgment has come, Jesus began the work of his pre-advent judgment in 1844. The year when Jesus inspired people all over the world to begin preaching the messages of Revelation 14. And Revelation 14, in the first angel's message, it's a call to worship. It's a call to worship. It's an urgent, urgent love letter to everyone. And if we read the verse, see, the first angel's message is not, let me repeat, it's not a message for them. Can I repeat that? The first angel's message is not a message for them. Let let me go back real quick. I I have to read that again. I want you to understand. Let's see here. Where are we at? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to to those who dwell on earth. Do we all dwell on earth? Unless you're an alien. I mean, what? We all dwell on earth. Okay, this is the Bible talking, not Pastor Jenkins. To every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and people. We all fit that category. Can you say amen? He says, tell everyone on this earth to fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So the first angel's message is not a message for them. It's a call to worship for all of us. The message calls for us to worship him who made heaven and earth. God asks us to remember this Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea there in the midst. In 1844 when Darwin was propounding the theory of evolution, God was calling people back to worship him as the creator. And at the very time evolution tried to threaten the authority of the Bible, God's people discovered the seventh-day Sabbath of God's word 
and began to keep it in honor of the creator of heaven and earth. And the seventh day Sabbath is an integral part of the first angel's message. So the first angel's message is telling everybody it's time to get ourselves ready. It's time to be filled with his spirit and his love. It's an urgent love letter. He's telling the world this is not a fearful letter. This is just saying the first angel's message is preparing everybody. He's saying it's an everlasting gospel. If you're lonely, this gospel can fill your loneliness. If you need hope, this everlasting gospel can fill your hope. If you want an assurance that, that your life can be changed through Jesus Christ, it can be changed through Jesus Christ, and he can stamp your ticket that we said, where I am, there ye may be also. It's an urgent love letter. And it's for all of us. But the problem is, if you allow it to be a problem, until you understand the first angel's message, you can't go to the second and third message. See, God is not looking for people who preach the three angels' message. Mm -hmm. He's not looking for a church who preaches and teaches the third. Not only, listen to me, don't cut me off. He's not looking for those who just preach the three angels' message. He's not looking just for a church that teaches the three angels' message. He's looking for those who live a life that lives the three angels' message. If you don't show love, don't go to two and three. And when people say, oh, you're preaching milk to us. Just like those students. How could they be passed on to a grade when they haven't learned the basic fundamentals of reading? Amen? That's why the Lord told the disciples. He said, I know you understand the message. He said, I know that. He said, I know you've been baptized. But don't dare leave Jerusalem until you've been showered, until you've been converted. Until you've had a change of heart. Mm -hmm. Until you say it's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Until that can happen in your life, don't you dare leave Jerusalem talking about preaching a gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You're going to turn more people away than you are going to win them to Christ. See, when people are out in the world, and they're living up, and it's not, that world is cruel. Yes, it's vicious. Yes. People will say any and everything to you. People won't just give you encouragement. Oh, they're ready to criticize you, but they won't give you the encouragement. They won't give you the time to understand why you're in the predicament that you're in. They haven't walked in your shoes. They don't know that you may have been raped as a child. They don't know if your family never told them that you love them. They don't know you've been motherless and fatherless. They don't know what you've gone through to drive you down the path that you've been through. You need somebody who will accept you as you are, a sinner saved by grace, somebody that can say, I love you just the way you are, but I can lead you down the path to help you to overcome your, your past demons. Yeah. I can embrace you and lead you to a savior that can say all things are passed away and all things can become new in your life. 
that's the kind of message I need to hear. That's the kind of message the world needs to hear. They don't need somebody who's going to judge them and tell them how bad they are or what they need to do or don't need to do. They don't need that. You get enough of that every day of your life. I need to know that everlasting gospel. I need to know a love that's beyond my understanding. I need to know there's a hope. If I can get that, oh, I'm willing to be a part of that kind of family. Amen. But the urgent love letter that God is giving us in Revelation 14, he's saying, I need you to understand it now because I'm coming soon. And I need you to understand and embrace this gospel because, see, for every decision, there's a consequence. And what's happening, I don't want you to be fooled by the deception of this world. I don't want you to be pulled into some kind of man-made religion that makes you think you're part of God when in reality you're really not. So I need your eyes to be open, your ears to be open, and I need your heart to be open so I can come in and give you the clarity of who I am. And I have some people, God's people, who are willing to reflect my character to you. But I'm coming soon, and I don't want you to get caught up in that. Because there's a judgment that follows when after Christ comes. What shall we preach? We preach an urgent letter of love. And in this urgent letter of love, we have to have messengers who have been converted. We have to have messengers who reflect God's character before we can go forward with the second or third message. Amen. What shall we preach? We preach the everlasting gospel. Let's bow our heads. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you today Thank you for being the God. See, we all need you today. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And we need to emphasize the fact that you are a God who can help us through our imperfections. We don't need to show a world or make a world feel we're perfect of ourselves. We're not. Pastors, not perfect. Elders, not perfect. Deacons, not perfect. Members of God, not perfect. But we're all sinners saved by grace. But we serve a perfect God that through his character, through the study of his Bible, through prayer, through coming together, encouraging each other, we grow and we're we fall in line on this road called transformation. And on this transformation with God, many have said and many will say it. I may not be where I want to be, but I lift up my hands to God and say, but I'm not where I used to be. And it's a transformation that we go through each and every day of our lives. Thank you for this urgent love letter, Lord. Because we need to know that we need to reflect your character. But we can't reflect your character if we're not born again. If we haven't been truly converted by the Holy Spirit. Somebody that may be here today, I don't, you know, you, I want this to between, be between you and God. You say, Lord, you know, um, my intentions have been great, I thought, but I need to stop and I need to go back to kindergarten and I need to give you my heart. I need to give you my mind. I need to understand that 
Lord, have I had my experience in the upper room? I want to be converted right now, Lord. It can't be about me. I can't get mad because people don't believe I, you know, because you know why I can't get mad? Because Paul said it clearly. He said, because it's no longer I that live, but it's you that live in me. They hung you on a cross, Lord. They beat you, Lord. They pierced you in your side. But the last few words you said before you died was not out of anger, were not you're going to get what's coming to you, you're going to go to hell. You didn't say any of those words, Lord. What you said was, and it should transcend to our lives today as we live our lives, you said, Lord, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the kind of love that we should have for each other. You said, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. But the second message you said was to love our neighbor as ourselves. I'm going to conclude with this last thought. In your word, you said that how can we say that we love you, whom we've never seen? But yet we can carry an art, yet we can carry an illness, yet we can carry an anger, yet we can carry all the differences in our work and in our, in our lives with someone else that we see every day. You see, we justify our anger. We justify the reason we feel the way we feel. But Lord, in your word, you tell us it's no longer you that live. And if you can tell someone and you can pray to God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, should not that be our same prayer? It's not about us. So Lord, be with us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.